Sure. Internet addiction is basically the obsessive or compulsive use of the internet or other digital media devices like an iPhone or a smartphone in a way that creates some negative or deleterious impact in your life. It has to impact your life in some negative way in one of the major spheres like home life, school, work, finances, legal status, health, medical issues. And if it doesn't impact one of those areas in a negative way, then it probably isn't an addiction. Although many of us might meet the criteria of internet abuse, where we overuse the technology on a regular basis, though not to an extent that it creates a problem in our lives. Well, there's been actually quite a bit of research on the incidence of internet addiction in the United States, and, and the figures are coming in somewhere between 3% on the low end and 6% on the high end. I've heard figures as high as 10. My research has come in at around 5 to 6%, which seems to be pretty consistently found in most of the studies. Well, like any other addiction, there is an over-reliance on the drug of choice. In this case, it's the internet. But usually, it's some form of imbalance in your life, because in order to meet the criteria for internet addiction, you have to be spending an excessive amount of time online. So the biggest negative impact, of course, is an imbalance coming from spending so much time on one facet of your life and not on the others. So we'll see changes in physical health, we'll see an increase in sedentary behavior, an increase in obesity, we'll see increases in social isolation or depression, a decrease in work or school performance, irritability, mood changes, um, changes in the way the person relates inter interpersonally or socially, as I said before, and more importantly, changes in primary relationship, whether it be with parents, children, or among spouses. Obviously, internet addiction is unique in the sense that you can't really live without the internet. Unlike drug and alcohol abuse, you can achieve a high degree of abstinence or complete abstinence where you don't use the drug or the alcohol. It would be very hard nowadays to live without the internet or to not live with a digital device like a smartphone or an iPhone. So what we do is we retrain the brain to use the technology differently. We also apply some blocks to the technology in terms of filtering or blocking software that block the sites that the person tends to abuse because we found that if we can get a five to 10 second lag between the time that they want the hit on the internet or on the device and the actual ability to get it, the frontal lobes of the brain can kick in and they can actually use better judgment. Because what happens when you're in an addictive phase, the brain is flooded with dopamine and it is in midbrain function. It is an old part of the brain that is pleasure oriented. When that happens, the frontal lobes, which are the thinking parts of the brain, kind of shut off. So that's why people make very bad judgments or poor judgments when they're in an addicted or acting out phase of their addiction. So our job is to kind of give them a little gap of space so they can actually, the frontal lobes can kick in and they can really think again. EMDR e stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. And this is a fairly cutting edge technology for treating anxiety and other mental health and addiction disorders. Um, using light, sound, and vibration to create a movement in patterns in the brain. We're not 100% sure actually how it works. It was developed by Dr. Francine Shapiro a number of years ago, and I've been using it for well over 10 or 15 years at this point quite successfully. It has applications in many areas of mental health, primarily in post-traumatic stress and in anxiety, but many people have adapted it, and it has been used quite successfully in the treatment of addictions and decreasing urges and cravings for the addictive behavior or addictive substance. Well, we use the light to decrease the craving or the urge for the use of the technology. So in the case of a video game or computer game, if that desire is rated at a 10 out of, let's say, a 0 to a 10 in terms of its uh, craving potential, we want to reduce that craving potential down to a, a two or a three to get the level of intensity to a point where it's more manageable. And the light actually does that. And I can't explain to you actually how it does that because we're really not sure. But it seems to have something to do with desynchronizing the right and left hemisphere 
or artificially producing what happens during REM sleep, which is involved in memory consolidation and emotional integration. So in a sense, it may be mimicking what happens during normal sleep, which has to do with producing good psychological health. If you rob yourself of deep sleep, which would include REM sleep, we see lots of changes in neurologic and psychological functions. So this seems to be an artificial way of inducing it. So it was discovered rather serendipitously, and it's been developed into using it for many applications, and addictions is one of them. Well, young boys, um, they're kind of a, a group unto themselves. Although video games are starting to be used by girls as well, the predominance of most of the shooter games and the um, first-person shooter games and the violent games are very attractive to boys. There's been lots of evidence and lots of data on the ex, um, exposure to violence on television with children, and a fair amount has been done with video games. Boys are highly attracted to this. They, boys are socialized and probably biologically predisposed to finding these games interesting. Um, there is a subset of, of a population that finds these games particularly useful and interesting, as well as the internet, which are kids with ADD or ADHD. Um, there's something about the focus and the narrowing of that focus that makes the internet, the computer, and video games and computer games very attractive. And they can sit still for hours playing these games, whereas in other formats they are not able to sit still. So we see a, almost all the kids that come in, or adolescents that come in, have some history of ADD, ADHD, or learning disabilities. Very high coincidence of these neurological issues along with the internet or gaming addiction. And is it possible to treat those children? Well, the, many in many cases, the children are already in treatment for those disorders, and the internet addiction or gaming addiction has become a concomitant problem, so that's why they're coming in to see me. In many cases, they're already on medication, but now we have to treat the, the gaming or internet addiction. They find it appealing because the games are designed from the ground up to capture their attention and to produce a lot of novelty. And kids with ADD crave novelty and hate mundane and routine tasks. And a video game is all about novelty and changeability and distractibility and shifting your attention from one thing to another and constantly having a lack of predictability in the game. The, the fact that there is no predictability and that the rewards happen without being able to predict it, both in terms of what the reward is going to be and, and how often it's going to be, makes it very, very appealing. What that schedule of reinforcement is, it's called a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. It's an operant conditioning schedule. Uh, a man who made this famous was B.F. Skinner many years ago when he looked at what conditioning schedules keep people doing what they normally would do. And what he found is that if you give somebody a reward, but you don't tell them when they're going to get it and what it's going to be, they'll keep doing that behavior over and over and over again, essentially forever. Because every once in a while, you get a hit. And every once in a while, when you get that hit, or when that kid gets that point, or gets that shot, or gets that kill, or that score, a level of dopamine is going to be secreted in the brain, and that's experienced as pleasure and they will keep doing that over and over again. This is what we see with slot machines and gambling. People will sit in front of a slot machine for 5, 10, 15 hours a day, knowing full well they'll probably walk out with no money. But neurologically, it captures them on a, on a deep level because the rewards are unpredictable. And every once in a while, they get something. But if they knew when they were going to get it, they'd walk away very quickly. The fact that they don't know when is what creates that variable ratio reinforcement schedule. And as far as I'm concerned, the whole internet, everything about the internet, Facebook, email, gaming, eBay, information searching on the internet, all operates on a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. That's why people check their email 50 times a day. Because every once in a while you get a good one, but you don't know what it's going to be and you don't know when you're going to get it. The term internet addiction is controversial because it really isn't a technical term yet. It is a media term, um, actually. The media likes the word internet addiction, and there are probably five or six other names for it, like digital media compulsion, or internet-enabled behavior, 
or impulse control disorder. There's all different titles. We do not have an agreed upon definition in the American Psychological or American Psychiatric Association. I don't believe the World Health Organization has come up with a term yet either. It is being studied now. There has been a good amount of research at this point. When I first wrote my book and did my research in the late 90s, we had almost no research and no writing on it. But now, 10 or 12 years later, we have a fair amount. And there's been a lot of doctoral dissertations done on it and a lot of funded research to look at it. So it probably isn't going to be called internet addiction in the big picture. It'll probably be called something like digital media addiction or digital media compulsion or something that implies an overuse. Actually, the word addiction is not used in psychiatry. We have two words to talk about uh, alcohol and substance addiction. One is abuse and one is dependence. So the, the word addiction really isn't used in, in medicine, at least in the United States, although the media certainly finds it to be a, a familiar term. Yes, I think it's only a matter of time before we have some formal diagnosis that will include it. It's too big of an issue, and if you talk to 100 doctors practicing anywhere in the United States and perhaps anywhere in the world at this point, you'll hear 90 of them say, yes, that's a problem, and we see it in our offices. So when you have a problem that is that widespread, eventually it has to be recognized. The fact that it's, we've really only been looking at this for a little over 10 years is not unusual. It took gambling 20 years to be recognized as a compulsive disorder. Nobody would argue that people can become addicted to gambling, but at one point, people did argue, and they thought it was an issue of moral or character as opposed to a neurologic issue. Most addictions have a strong neurological component because when you have a habit, you get an over-representation over of certain dendritic pathways in the brain. So basically, you get a thickening or a reinforcing of a pattern in the brain. And literally, there's a neurologic substrate to that pattern. So it's sort of like having a, a thicker wire that gets developed from use over and over again. And in order to change that pattern or that habit, you have to let that atrophy and wither and build new patterns that are alongside the old patterns. So I think addictions are both psychologic and neurologic. They're, they're not just about thoughts and feelings, they're also about the way our brains are programmed. The practical considerations around not having an agreed definition are obviously financial, in the sense that most insurance companies that reimburse for health care in the United States would not recognize an internet addiction. In fact, there have been numerous cases that have been challenged based on that. But there are other diagnoses that could subsume the diagnosis of internet addiction, and that's what most of us do. We use other diagnoses that will include the concept of uh, uh, an impulsive or compulsive pattern of behavior, although it's not specifically referenced as the internet. Um, so I don't know that it has significant, I mean, obviously research money and the ability for the information to be disseminated at the university and medical school level. I teach at the medical school and, um, in Connecticut, and there are no seminars that I know of in most of the universities where this is taught at the university or medical school uh, level. Most of the teaching I do is either through my writing or through lectures that I do either to private organizations or at the university level. But it's not been integrated into course curriculums yet. So as it becomes more recognized, I think we'll start to see it being taught at, to students, both as psychology students and psychiatry students. Yeah, there, are, there is a, a, a small group of people that argue that. And I would say that that argument is somewhat spurious. I don't really care what it's called, and I don't really care what, what it comes from. The fact is, on a phenomenological level, it exists, and people are addicted and are compulsive with the use of these behaviors. And whether we treat one thing or another, or an, uh, we target one thing or another, or we label one thing or another, I'm less concerned about it. The diagnosis is actually not that important to me. What's important to me is if I've got a kid in my office who's overusing the video game, let's treat that and figure out a way to make it less. Whether you label it as a compulsive disorder or an impulse control problem or an obsessive compulsive personality or who cares? The bottom line is you've got to help the person and fix the problem. Well, it's definitely a growing problem. 
um, because the amount of penetration in the market, at least in the US, is approaching 80%. And uh, as internet speeds increase, as affordability of the in internet increases, as technology improves, and now we're into the wireless or untethered phase of the technology, we're now rolling out 4G technology in the United States. It exists in other parts of the world long before we got it. But 4G technology in the United States wirelessly means that basically you'll be able to game wirelessly with no buffering and no lag. So the more you untether the technology, the more addictive it becomes because the shorter the lag between the desire and the behavior and the hit that you get, the more addictive the behavior becomes. Well, education, consciousness, choice, um, teaching people that the technology is addictive. I mean, most people are just beginning to get the idea that this technology is addictive and that they may need to treat it with some degree of care and scrutiny, like cigarettes, like alcohol, like gambling. We know that those things are addictive now. When they first came out, we challenged their addictive potential as well. There was a very long phase of public education and public acceptance and eventually laws and public education programs and prevention and treatment came about after that. So it's, I don't foresee that being any different with internet addiction. Eventually there'll be warning labels. There are warning labels on games now in terms of content, but I think there needs to be warning labels on games that this content can be addictive, that um, just like there is on cigarettes. But you know how long it took us to put those stupid labels on cigarettes? People, the, the cigarette industry lobbied against that for decades. They fought against it, even though we had evidence to show that it was highly damaging. So eventually, they'll, so the more people, the better people are educated, the more likely they'll be able to make better choices, the more that we'll be able to, in the healing community, help them, and the more readily available that help will become.